Hare Krishna. So once again, uh, we welcome all of you for today's Bhakti Shasi class. So today we are going to begin with the section 4, which includes verses 9 to 11, titled as Knowledge and Knee Science. So before we begin to the section, uh, let us quickly uh, take a look of how Isha Upanishad's flow have built up so far. So Isha Upanishad begins with uh, the mantra one, Isha Vasyam Edam Sarvam Yat Kincham Jagatayam Jagat, uh, where Isha, the definition of Isha was given. He is the supreme controller, proprietor of everything and he awards uh, everyone's quota and one should live according to that. Then in the next two verses, mantra two and three, uh, the description was of those who follow and who do not follow Isha's rule, the consequences, the results were described in mantra two and mantra three. Mantra two said, Kurva neveha karmani jijivisik shatam samaha. The one who understands and follows uh, or lives by the principles and the teachings of Isha, Isha Vasya principle, such a person can continue to live for long and whatever activity is not karma lipitenare, whatever activities he perform does not bind him into furtive activities. He becomes freed from all furtive activities. However, for one who does not live by this principle of knowledge, Asura Namate Loka Mantra 3, Andhena Tamasavrataha, uh, he is casted into <coughs> or else he is sent into a hellish conditional life. His current life, the present life becomes hellish and also the future uh, life is like that. So that was in text number 2 and 3 and then 4 and 5 described about the, um, you can say the inconceivable nature of the Supreme Personality Godhead and then from mantra 6 to mantra 8 was a vision of a pure devotee. Now we are coming to a fourth section, uh, also the fifth section which is 12 to 14 verses. Here, uh, the focus would be, theme is in the same direction, uh, just like as mantra 2 and 3, the consequences of one who follows Ishavasa principle and who does not follow, what are the results? In 9 to 11, particularly the four verses that we're going to focus for this week and the next week, today we're going to cover 9 and next week we'll cover both 10th and 11th, the discussion is on the concept of Vidya and Avidya. What happens when one lives by Vidya, what is the result one gets? And what happens to those who cultivate Avidya and what is the result? So we're just mapping here two themes, just like in Mantra 2 and 3, the consequences are given, uh, you know, the different set of results of following Isha Vasa principle and not. Similarly here, it is described the different results are obtained by cultivating Vidya and by cultivating Avidya. And similarly, in text number 12 to text number 14, uh, the same theme continues about worshipping the Supreme Personality Godhead. There is a, another set of result, and by worshipping anything else apart from Supreme Personality Godhead gives you another set of result. The more or less about consequences. So another way of looking at it, as one of the acharyas explained, in mantra 6 to 8, the vision of a pure devotee was explained. Now, from mantra 9 to 11 and 12 to 14, describes how to cultivate that vision. So, vision means to perceive, to see the reality, and to see the reality, it depends on the knowledge. So, mantra 9 to 11 talks about what is real knowledge and what is not knowledge. Understanding that, one can cultivate the vision of a pure devotee, which was described in mantra 6 to 8. So, we're going to take a look briefly through the three verses from 9 to 11, then we'll come back to the ninth verse. So, all of us can recite together. Text number 9. Andham tama praveshanti ye avityam pasate tato bhuya ivate tamo yayu vityayam rataha. So, andham tama praveshanti. Andam is, I'm looking at word to word meaning from the book. Andam refers gross ignorance. Tamaha refers to darkness. Pravishanti means to enter. Who enters into this uh, kind of a situation uh, full of darkness and ignorance? Ye avidyam upasate. 
वन हु वर्शिप्स अविद्या उपासते इज टू टू बी इन अविद्या इज वन थिंग टू वर्शिप अविद्या इज ऑल टूगेदर डिफरेंट कॉन्सेप्ट विल टॉक अबाउट इट सो इसे ये अविद्या उपास वन हु वर्शिप अविद्या दे गो टू दिस अंधम तमा प्रविशन थी देन इफ यू लुक एट द थर्ड लाइन ततो भूया इबाते तमो यायु विद्यायाम रतः ततः विच मीन्स फर्दर भूया इट इज कंसिडर्ड इवा ते तम द वन गोज इन टू फार मच मोर डार्कनेस हु गोज इन टू फार मच मोर डार्कनेस यायु विद्यायाम रतः रथ मीन्स एंगेज वन वॉज एंगेज इन द कल्चर ऑफ नॉलेज इज कास्टेड इन टू अ फार मच मोर हेलिश कंडीशन ऑफ लाइफ हाउ मेनी यू थिंक यू आर लिल कन्फ्यूज नाउ वट्स गोइंग ऑन इफ कल्टिवेटिंग इग्नोरेंस वॉज बैड ईश्व पनिशद सिंह कल्टिवेटिंग नॉलेज इज फार मोर वर्स फॉल राइट दिस इज नॉट द एंड ऑफ डिवेलपमेंट लेट्स टेक अ लुक अहेड एंड look at the follow verses we will come back to the whole discussion here in a short while text number 10 anya devahur vidyaya anya dahur vidyaya iti shushru madhiranam yenas tat vichachakshire briefly looking at what word meaning of the shloka also anyad eva आहु विद्यया अन्य मीन्स अदर ए वॉज सर्टनली आहु इट इज डिस्क्राइब अ सैड विद्यया वन काइंड ऑफ रिजल्ट इज ऑप्टेन्ड बाय कल्टिवेटिंग नॉलेज अन्य आहुर अविद्या एंड अनदर काइंड ऑफ रिजल्ट इज ऑप्टेन्ड बाय कल्टिवेटिंग अविद्या शुश्रुमा दस हाउ हाउ डू वी नो दैट शुश्रुमा आई हैव हर्ड इट द स्पीकर इज सेइंग फ्रॉम होम धीरा नाम फ्रॉम अ सेज ऑफ अ स्टडी माइंड ये नस्तद विच अ चक्षरे एंड इट इज लाइक दिस हैज बीन एक्सप्लेन दैट वन हू कल्टिवेट नॉलेज गेट्स अ डिफरेंट डेस्टिनेशन वन हू कल्टिवेट इग्नोरेंस गेट्स अ डिफरेंट डेस्टिनेशन दैट्स टेक्स नंबर टाइम टेक्स नंबर टेन हियर ओके लेट्स मूव फॉरवर्ड टेक्स नंबर इलेवन Now you might wonder what do you mean by different destination because in the text number 9 it was said one who cultivates a vidya he goes to hellish conditional life and one who is cultivating vidya is put into more darkness seems like a same destination but text number 10 says no there are different destinations now to just add to the confusion more text number 11 vidyam cha vidyam cha yastad vedo bhayam sah अविद्या मृत्यु तीतवा विद्या आमृत आश्नुते नाउ टेक्स्ट नंबर 11 डिस्क्राइब्स द रिजल्ट टेक्स्ट नंबर 10 सेड यू विल गेट टू डिफरेंट रिजल्ट्स टेक्स्ट नंबर 11 डिस्क्राइब्स व्हाट आर द रिजल्ट्स वन गेट्स व्हेन यू कल्टीवेट्स विद्या एंड अविद्या विद्याम चा मींस आल्सो एंड इट कैन आल्सो मींस एंड विद्या एंड अविद्या यस्तद वेदो भयम सह सह मींस टुगेदर saha you know it's a simple word to understand together simultaneously so here the speaker is saying yastad vedo bhayam vedo uh, ved me veda refers us to know ubhayam means both so it's saying one should cultivate both vidya and avidya simultaneously and what will happen avidyaya mrityum tirtva that ignorance awards death and vidya amritam ashnute ashnute one attains amritam so when one cultivates both knowledge and ignorance simultaneously and together one recognizes and understands that avidya will take you to the place of death and vidya will take you to the place of eternity so this is how it is described let's read out the translation only one who can learn the process of knee science and that of transcendent knowledge side by side can transcend the influence of repeated birth and death and enjoy the full blessings of immortality hare krishna are you all okay is making little sense or somebody is little confused vidya avidya 
what are we talking about here? Anyone would like to give their purport or their understanding of what we just discussed? I kind of went through word by word and paraphrased the translations like that. Let's take a quick vote here. How many of you feel you're a little confused what's going on with these verses? Please raise your hands. Not everyone is raising hands. So those who are not raising hands, I'm going to call out your name right now, okay? So you have to explain what you understood out of it. <laughs> okay. So this is a classic uh, Upanishad verses, which are very, very difficult to decipher. So very, the first thing which I have been repeating lately in the last one week, uh, some of you might be aware that we have just starting a three set of programs beginning from 2nd September about reading, you know, there are some reading clubs we are starting. So I had a back and forth discussion and the debate on it and so forth. Uh, one of our teacher, devotee teacher, really wanted to do that. So I was like, no, reading would not help. There has to be a Shavadam also. Nonetheless, as a side point, I think I'm trying to make here is, um, just imagine you're reading this, you know. First of all, Sanskrit we hardly know. So we we'll probably would not understand. Uh, just to let you know, it is said for every word, there are 12 different meanings, but there are different, different dictionaries, Sanskrit dictionaries, and then you can come to different, uh, you know, interpretations of it. Now, you don't draw a meaning from a single word. Any shloka would have at least 10 to 12 words minimum, right? And for every word, you can have a different set of meanings. So you can understand how many different, different interpretations can be, can be brought out from that one Sanskrit shloka. So therefore it is said, Sanskrit is not understood uh, word by word. Sanskrit meaning has to be understood in the context. For example, why so many people fail to understand or uh, draw a correct meaning of Bhagavad Gita? Bhagavad Gita has four key verses or seed verses which is called Chatur Shloki Bhagavad Gita. 10th chapter verse number 8, 9, 10 and 11. Unless one has understood that, you cannot give a commentary on Bhagavad Gita. 10.8 very clearly says, Aham sarvasya prabhu mataha sarvam pravartate iti matva bhajante maam saame yukta tamo mataha. Uh, I am the cause of everything. Aham sarvasya prabhu. Everything, the material and spiritual, everything have manifested from me. Aham sarvasya prabhu. Mataha sarvam pravartate. And the one who knows iti matva bhajante maam, one who knows this, engages in my devotional service. One who understands this, these four verses follow three other verses, then you can come to a right conclusion if somebody begins to give a, a right a translation for Sanskrit. Similarly for Srimad Bhagavatam, there are four seed verses that comes in the second canto. Chatur Shloki Srimad Bhagavatam, second canto, ninth chapter, verse number 33, 34, 35, and 36, spoken by Lord Vishnu himself to Brahma. So unless we have that clarity, we cannot really understand what Srimad Bhagavatam wants. Because Srimad Bhagavatam also speaks about various things. For example, in Govardhan Leela, I guess I gave this example before also. Uh, when I read it for the first time, that particular section, 10th Canto, I really had to scratch my head for a while. You know, before the Govardhan Leela begins, Lord Sri Krishna, Kana, who was a seven-year-old boy at that time, he went and spoke to Nanda Maharaj and the other seniors, uh, the assembly, and he established, uh, you know, uh, what is it called as uh, the philosophy of karma. Um, sorry, the name skipped my head. There's a technical name for it. So, which means karma is superior. So, Lord Shri Krishna, there are almost six, seven verses where Lord Shri Krishna speaks to Nanda Maharaj that why you have to depend on Indra? What does Indra do? If you do the right work, Karma is the most supreme. If you do the right work, you'll get the results. The devtas are bound by the laws of the nature to award you. And imagine if you have to read that section, so you think, oh really, Krishna himself is saying, you know, that to Krishna is speaking. <laughs> it's not, it's not Kamsa is telling you, Hiridakashivu telling you the seventh canto or something like that. It's Krishna himself saying. So it's very, very bewildering. And something like that is apparently happening here. So therefore, the very first thing, uh, we cannot understand scriptures unless we hear it. Uh, Prahlad Maha says, Shavanam Kirtanam Vishnu. So, uh, Adhyan is not the process, Shavanam is the process. When one have done Shavanam, then comes Adhyan. Then you can read and understand, without it's not possible. In case of Srila Prabhupada books, 
Prabhupada books, reading Prabhupada book in that way is like Shravanam itself because Prabhupada spoke it. You know, so that way it is Shravanam. But yet we still need to hear to understand it becomes difficult. So this was just a classic verse of Isha Upanishad where, you know, it becomes a little complicated. So let's take a look uh, what these three verses are trying to tell us in essence. So verse number 9, 10, 11, this is the table which you want to draw for yourself, keep in handy for the this week and the next week. Otherwise, you'll get confused between Vidya and Avidya. So text number 9, 10, 11 speaks again and again about the concept of Vidya and Avidya. What is the Avidya that text number 9 indicates? That meaning is a little different from the meaning in the other two verses. Now here, Avidya refers to uh, ignorant pursuit of sense gratification. Now what is ignorant pursuit of sense gratification? Which means like modern education. There is no knowledge of spiritual life. And uh, you know, a child is sent to a modern education system. He goes through that education. Uh, the education that is given to him is to cultivate sense gratification. You know, in our material education, if you see, we have knowledge about, we study in entirely about the prison house that we live in, right? We talked about this and that, but we don't talk about how to escape the prison house. Otherwise, the mundane education really tells us about how this whole prison house function and what are the things into it. For an example, Srila Prabhupada uh, went to Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. You might have heard of this case study, you know, this example. Prabhupada said, oh, this is the world's biggest and the most famous university. Uh, where is a department for life and death? You know, you have this technical department, that technical department, and they were clueless. Professors were clueless. So when the program ended, Prabhupada came out and Prabhupada said, well, MIT should not be called as Massachusetts Institute of Technology, it should be called as Maya's Institute of Technology because it is bewildering people. It is misguiding students from the true path. So Avidyam here refers to Oh, Hare Krishna. Yes. So, Avidya here refers to the ignorance of spiritual life. But when it comes, Avidya Mupasate, which refers to persuade of sense gratification, then it becomes worshipping of Avidya. We'll give you some examples when we move forward. So, I hope this is clear. Avidya refers to a modern education which deprives you or does not teach you anything about spiritual knowledge and thus keeps you in ignorance about the truth. That is called as avidya. So modern education that way becomes avidya. But vidya upasate, because we, it's mentioned vidya upasate, which means uh, the knowledge which teaches you to chase after sense gratification. That is avidya here means in that way. Now what about vidya? Tato bhaiya ivate tamo yayu vidya yam rataha. So this vidya in the ninth verse which, which is spoken, which says when you cultivate this, you go further in a darkness, is that vidya, these are the false religionists and the false spiritualists who claims to know spiritual knowledge, who claims that they know everything, yet on the spiritual ground, they only encourage uh, sense gratification and sinful activities. Let me give you one example. This is back in America, uh, Srila Prabhupada, uh, you know, when our movement was growing up and becoming famous, you know, 69 or 70, uh, one disciple of Prabhupada brought a pamphlet to Srila Prabhupada. And the pamphlet was an advertisement of a new guru that had come from India to America. And that guru said, stay high forever. He was literally copying Srila Prabhupada's concept. He said, I have a secret to keep you high forever. Please come, you know, I'm just giving a paraphrase of it. Stay high forever. Come and, you know, join our program. Uh, you don't have to give up meat eating. You don't have to give up intoxication. You don't have to give up gambling. You don't have to give up illicit sex. Everything is allowed. And I'll give you the secret formula so that you can stay high forever. So Prabhupada began to laugh. Now what this advertisement meant was because Prabhupada movement had already became famous and Prabhupada emphasized and spoke very clear, no meat eating, no intoxication, no gambling, no less sex. So he had started a movement for those who could not adjust here or who wanted to practice spiritual life but did not want to give up these things. 
this is called as this vidya who claims that i know spiritual knowledge but actually they cheat their followers so here we are going we're going to get into the case study of mayavadis again all right propas is going to take full privilege to ban, bash mayavadis and of course the modern educators and what not so that is the meaning of fear vidya vidya refers to that we uh, i mean vidya refers to knowledge uh, only for pursuing sense gratification so forgetfulness it is said or it can be said forgetfulness of isha vasya principle is can be said as avidya you know ignorance forgetfulness of isha uh, isha vasya principle but when a person chases after sense gratification then it becomes avidya upasate that means the worship of it so 10th verse talks about knowledge for pursuit of sense gratification that is the 10th and vidya there refers to knowledge for pursuit of krishna consciousness so now in 10th uh, there is a clear uh, demarcation made between avidya and vidya uh, ignorance refers to knowledge for the pursuit of sense gratification and vidya refers to knowledge for the pursuit of krishna consciousness and 10th verse says iti shushruma dhiranam yena sat vichachakshire we have heard from authorities one of our authorities that both the path gives different result and text number 11 describes the result of cultivating avidya vidya simultaneously so what is the vidya and vidya which is mentioned again 11th verse uh, that refers to knowledge of uh, bodily maintenance and knowledge for pursuit of krishna consciousness there is a slight difference between avidya in text 11 as in compared to previous verses in text 11 the speaker encourages us to cultivate avidya and vidya together so what is that what is that uh, what are we uh, encouraged to cultivate is to cultivate enough material knowledge so that we can maintain our body if you don't know how to take care of the body then how would you perform spiritual life so for example even within a scan the parents send their kids to school or college isn't it just to get enough knowledge so you are able to maintain yourself professionally and live a family life however if that crosses that limit and that knowledge which the child gets becomes a reason for him to pursue sense gratification and give up krishna consciousness that it is entirely uh, condemnable is it making sense these are the differences here well i don't know if it really making sense i assume it is making sense <laughs> we'll continue with the ninth verse or it talks about okay so this is just a little introduction on this uh, little tricky subject uh, any time if you have a doubt please feel free to clarify that So let's move forward mantra number 9 what's the connection and what's the main theme let's take a look at it so connection here is uh, it describes the fate of those who do not know or falsely do not know means avidya or falsely claim to possess the knowledge of lord as presented in mantra 8 which means vidya so these are the false gurus So what's going to happen to them is described in text number 9 andham tama pravishanti is what happens to them What is the main theme worse than ignorance and materialist is the pseudo spiritualist who mislead others with misguided knowledge So you see propad would not get so upset and angry at times with the modern scientists and the educators to a degree purpose would get angry particularly with mayavadis never ever i have heard a conversation where purpose said i will kick the scientist with my boot but you might have heard i'll kick that guru's face with my boot how many of you heard kind of you know refer this you know you, why this is the context because purpose would call them rascals because they pretending to know are cheating people on the basis of knowledge like propose say you know a so falana dikana guru if he wants to you know give his own philosophy why he has to misinterpret bhagavad gita let him write his own bhagavad gita let him have his own dialogue with his disciple why these rascals have to give a misinterpretation of bhagavad gita and misguide people and propose that that situation would definitely often get wild and this is the reason because they are blasphemers they offend the lord but denying lord's existence mayavadis in one sense are atheists you know 
uh, you can call Mayavadis were ancient atheists. Uh, you know, whereas we have a modern atheist who totally deny the existence, whereas Mayavadis will use the scriptures to deny the existence of God, and they will come to a conclusion: You are God, I am God, everyone is God, and then everyone is God. Then where is the question of one supreme God? So that's how they will deceive uh, their students by talking in this manner. Fine. So let's take a look uh, at a quick overview of this, and then we'll start reading the purport. In the very first paragraph, Srila Prabhupada talks about Vidya versus Avidya. Then Avidyam Upasati, second to fourth paragraph, the worship of Avidya. And then Vidyayam Rataha, you know, the so-called Vidya. There Prabhupada is going to talk about godless modern education, Vedavadarataha, these are the Brahmanas who claim to know Vedic knowledge but they, uh, they kind of encourage fruitive activities and sense gratification, karma kanda. Maya ahaprat jnana is another uh, category where Prabhupada talks about those whose intelligence has been stolen and they draw wrong conclusions like that. So with that, let's take a look and let's start uh, reading from the first paragraph. There's a little introduction to it. First of all, before we get into it, are you clear with the word Vidya and Avidya in text 9? Avidya Upasate means persuade of sense gratification, where there is an ignorance of spiritual knowledge. Vidyayam Rataha means uh, where so-called spiritualist or religionist deceives an individual by claiming to say that they know or they have knowledge. And those who claim knowledge, such a people go in a further darkness. That is what text number 9 says. So who would like to read the first paragraph? You may raise your hand. And our Hainam Prabhu would guide the forum here. He would probably ask you. Go ahead. Hare Krishna, Bandar Pranam. Can you hear me? Very well. Yes, Mother. In this mantra, there is a comparative study of Vidya and Avidya. Avidya or ignorance is undoubtedly dangerous, but Vidya or knowledge, when mistaken or misguided, is even more dangerous. In modern human civilization, this explanation of Sri Ishopanishad is more applicable than at any other time in the past. Modern civilization has advanced considerably in the matter of mass education, and yet, the result is that people are more unhappy than before on account of too much stress on material advancement, without any taste for the most important aspect of life, the spiritual aspect. So modern civilization has advanced considerably proper rights in the middle of the purport. Hare Krishna. Uh, and yet the result is that people are more unhappy than before on account of too much stress on material advancement. So probably all of you would agree, materially we are quite comfortable now. Yes or no? We have far greater means of comfort. However, to that much degree we are comfortably miserable. More and more uh, miseries and anxieties we face with. How many of you agree with this The generation today? is far much more reckless, uh, has far much more anxiety and stress than the previous generation. Yes, no, no, yes. What's your answer? Uh, our group from UK, uh, BBC had published this news and they found out back in 2014, up to that time, they, their study showed that the senior citizens who are above 60 or 70 would feel loneliness. Uh, would feel stress and anxiety. By 2019, when they did a study, they found out the numbers got interchanged. It was the teenagers who felt uh, higher, higher rates of stress, anxiety and loneliness. And the reason was very simple, social media. Because until 2013 and 14, as the BBC study went, uh, you know, the teenagers would go out probably, would play and add friends. But by 2019, within a couple of years, uh, everyone started living in a virtual world. 
people stopped having real friends you know for senior citizens in the west to say that they're lonely is understandable because that's the culture at least teenagers live with the friends they live in a community they are experiencing higher stress and anxiety this is the truth of today's world that's a reality and that's what proper is saying the very first thing proper says in the purport otherwise is avidya is undoubtedly dangerous but vidya knowledge when mistaken or misguided is even more dangerous just like um the name skipped is a very famous author and a philosopher in america he said we have controlled machines and uncontrolled minds we have guided missiles and misguided men very profound statement he puts this whole thing in a context you know we have able to have guided missiles we have controlled machines but the man has become more and more uncontrolled so what is this avidyam upasate you know worship uh, worship of uh, uh, f- fruitless worship of sense gratification one devotee was giving an interesting example uh, you might have heard of you know uh, in south india sometimes some people uh, you know they will make a temple of their hero uh, like rajnikant dev devata rajnikant if you go to andhra pradesh devata chiranjeevi and probably you come to maharashtra then devata amitabh bachchan or sachin tendulkar you know these are these are the example of avidya upasate now you may think oh you know indians are sentimental and foolish and what not so i'm going to give you a little global picture so this is back in 1980s george hyson and beetle group when it was really really famous so george hyson i mean one upon a time he had stayed in a hotel and he had used the hotel given towel and the manager there somehow managed to take the towel keep it with him and after a few years this is a post departure of george hyson from this world and after that when george hyson had passed away after that he decided to auction the towel that george hyson had used to wash his body <laughs> now this is really called as avidya upasate and it was sold off in a uh, you know i don't know very very several thousands and thousands of pounds people had paid to buy a used up old dirty stinky towel that has wiped the body of another human being <laughs> this is an example of avidya upasate a senseless pursuit of sense gratification so that is what is being described that uh, when a modern education does not bring in this uh, the reality of a life then people get into so much ignorance that the, the need for happiness uh, it drives them so much to an extent of craziness that they try to look for it find for it in anything and everything i will remember i was in america then and columbus ohio there was a concert uh, in our ohio state university campus and some very famous pop star had come i don't remember the name and all that <laughs> i just happened to be there for just for some time of course i didn't have purchased a ticket i would definitely never pay money for all this thing so i remember to be there around for some time and when the star had come on the stage it was it was described that many girls and the men who were right in the front aisle they fainted Uh, the you know the vishnu avatar had descended on the stage <laughs> as soon as they saw them they kind of fainted on the ground and you know the medical help ohio state university had this uh, medical center also and that whole evening the the ambulance was running back and forth back and forth getting this fainted disciples and uh, sold out devotees of this pop star picking them up bringing to the hospital so this is what it means avidya upasate my papa says and it's just fruitless and futile because there's no happy there's all f- only a frustration so that's a little bit about the first paragraph let's go to the second paragraph now where papa is going to talk about more on the subject of avidya upasate how they worship avidya uh, please uh, go ahead and somebody can read it yes as far as vidya is concerned 
the first mantra has explained very clearly that the supreme lord is the proprietor of everything and that forgetfulness of this fact is ignorance the more a man forgets this fact of life the more he is in darkness in view of this a godless civilization directed towards the so called advancement of education is more dangerous than a civilization in which the masses of people are less educated thank you the last line says the more a man forgets this fact of life and what is the fact of life ishavasa principle the more he is in darkness and view of this a godless civilization directed towards a so called advancement of education is more dangerous than a civilization in which the mass of people are less advanced propada is categorically making this point because today's society is said to be more advanced you know they talk about it we are more advanced highly advanced and sophisticated previous generations or our ancestors from stone age and what not they talk about it Uh, but papa says so called advancement of education is more dangerous than a civilization what is the purpose of education this subject matter comes in our bhagavad gita study uh, education let me put it this way let me ask you uh, this way who do you think is more qualified to understand the message of bhagavad gita you know one a phd scholar but a drunkard a simple village boy with a good character uh, good ethics and a third uh, a vedic scholar uh, but highly money minded and he wants to utilize uh, his vedic knowledge for the purpose of making money for himself the three categories all right three options so what's your option a phd scholar highly intellectual uh, probably a sanskrit scholar himself but a drunkard a second a simple villager good in characters and ethics a truthful man and third and of course he is a believer in god that is a kind of important character and third uh, is a veda vadarata you can say uh, you know brahmana and what not uh, who were in learned in sanskrit and everything uh, his objective of that studying bhagavad gita is how to go and make money so all of you agree this is second no doubt about it isn't it so the message of bhagavad gita is understood not on the basis of your intellectual ability and capability message of bhagavad gita is entirely dependent on one's characters and ethics and krishna says in fourth chapter verse number 2 arjuna you know evam parampara prapta that verse comes in the third verse following up i am giving you this wisdom because you're non envious so the point i'm trying to make here is education has a value as long as it is able to cultivate character in a person i'll say that again uh education even a mundane education has a value as long as it is able to make a man of a character imagine uh you 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 teach medical science or the science of surgery to a thief and give him a knife what do you expect he's going to do isn't it and we have heard so many cases particularly in the case of pregnancy i don't know about west but at least in india it's so common uh, one uh, one of our student is a doctor um uh, whatever they call this field of pregnancy and she when she went to the when when she finished her education there was a very famous uh, medical institute in pune where she was uh, she got job as a doctor there and when the first time she went in the you know to uh test uh, to investigate a patient uh who whose delivery was due when she tested out she said it was totally fine she could have a natural pregnancy natural birth how a later on the senior doctor came and she forced the patient to believe that if she goes through a natural delivery then the mother has a risk to her life and they forced the mother to go on an operation theater and cesarean something you call it right uh, that operation thing and this uh, student uh, who had got married by that time she called me up she was in tears and she said prabhuji this is such a cheating you know i was personally there there was no need for operation so i said why did they do operation she said because that's how the hospital makes money you know if there was a natural birth then there was no operation cost and the doctor has his own commission so she told me the, the the lady doctor who was her senior 
she told him later that day only uh, you know why are you making so much fuss this is how we make a living it's a commission based system so you have a doctor or any profession i'm just giving one example that i knew of here uh, that's what popa is saying the godless civilization directed towards a so called advancement of education is more dangerous because they're not fulfilling the purpose of education uh, look at it in today's education system is there any focus on character ethics and integrity any focus have you even seen the eighth standard uh, you know the books that from where they teach moral values is disgusting they teach about from the eighth standard they teach about illicit relationships and they at least in india i'm talking about uh, because we had been a little bit connected with designing a syllabus lately for government you know it teaches about uh, illicit relationship boyfriend girlfriend second thing it teaches about largely it teaches about how uh, you know there always had been a suppression of women in indian society ladies need to be given freedom and what not they should be allowed and different different things it has got nothing to do with values and characters is a political agenda which gets fulfilled on the name of moral values and moral education and we have the situation in front of all of us despite having all the technical advancement and everything the life you know ideally if you look at all the advancement that advancement technological advancement should have brought about fearlessness yes or no if we are really advancing then we should be becoming fearless that is a real sense of advancement what is the meaning of advancement if you are becoming more fearful what do you think is today's generation is more fearful or lesser fearful now today the parents if the kids have to go down and play there is so much anxiety would the child come back or not yes or no and let me ask this question to all of you when you used to go and play out did your mother and father ever bother kahe hai tinku pinku you know whole day we used to be out we used to come back at our own time mother was busy with her household affairs father was busy with the whole thing nobody ever asked mother would say beta khana khaya it's time for lunch it's time for dinner break but that's all the three things mother would say and you do whatever you want to do <laughs> yes now tell me all of you your parents how much stress and anxiety is there you know if the child goes out of your eyesight vision you become an anxiety there's so much fear what's going to happen that is what proper is saying the so called advancement of education is more dangerous what is technical advance technology we have cameras we have smartphones we should be fearless now in fact we are more fearful and this is apparently the uh, unfortunate situation of the society today all right this is what happens with avidya mupasate let's move forward next paragraph of the different classes of men karmis gnanis and yogis the karmis are those who are engaged in the activities of sense gratification in the modern civilization 99.9% of the people are engaged in the activities of sense gratification under the flags of industrialism economic development altruism political activ- activism and so on all these activities are more or less based on sen- satisfaction of the senses to the exclusion of the kind of god consciousness described in the first mantra a little twist in the story of george hyson towel i just realized i have made a note here i forget a very important detail to that story a very important story of isho panishad i would say <laughs> actually george hyson towel was not auctioned as it is there was such a huge demand such a huge demand the manager had to cut the towel into 16 pieces and then give it off <laughs> it was cut off into 16 part and then given off away to the public anyways so interesting huh which is mentioned 99% of people in modern society are engaged in the activities of sense gratification and the flags of various activities etc etc in ramayan uh, there is a statement comes which says when ravana uh, saw sita not only heard sita uh, heard about sita from uh, uh, you know superka when ravana had actually kidnapped and later on Ravana told Sita that after creating you god must have retired now it might sound like a, oh what a praise 
you know it looks like a flat tree uh, maybe for a woman it may look like you know the person is praising but actually it has another perspective to it it talks a lot about the consciousness of the person where the person in our case ravana here the mentality is only exploitation whatever i see is meant for my enjoyment uh that's what happens you know just like uh, you probably would be aware of uh you know uh, now the plots the, the land sale has become very expensive uh, at least you know in india certain parts and of course sure in london and elsewhere so now there is a land sale going on moon and people are purchasing uh, passes of land on moon uh, tom cruise right there was this whole article the what he had shared he had a he has a plot in moon so i don't know who is selling off <laughs> but again it's a very beautiful analogy my senior used to share this he used to say the consciousness of a conditioned soul is like an antenna you know of course antenna that analogy holds true for everyone for that reason you know uh, just like as soon as a person wakes up in the morning his consciousness gets activated again and it begins to survey so today who i'm going to exploit what is there for my enjoyment so either you call them karmis you call them gyanis you call them yogis all of them are after their own sense gratification and on the basis of sense gratification as a base of all their activities they create different different kind of isms like altruism socialism industrialism etc etc that's what goes on so mentality is one of same uh, if i can enjoy it then i should go for it uh, that's the point of it and yes that's the point being explained here all these activities more or less are based on the satisfaction of the senses without any reference to the sort of god consciousness please go ahead the next paragraph in the language of the bhagavad gita 7.15 people who are engaged in gross sense, sense gratification are known as asses the asses is symbol of stupidity those who simply engage in the profitless pursuit of sense gratification are worshiping avidya according to sri sopanishad and those who play the role of helping this sort of civilization in the name of educational advancement are actually doing more harm than those who are on the platform of gross sense gratification the advancement of learning by a godless people is as dangerous as a valuable jewel on the hood of a cobra a cobra de- decorated with a valuable jewel is more dangerous than one not decorated in the hari bhakti sudodaya 311 uh, 3.11.2 yeah that's a uh, we can't we'll pause that's the next paragraph in the book uh, we'll we'll come to it huh we'll just go with this so is my presentation visible yes so let's conclude with this avidya mupasate so what is avidya mupasate avidya refers to forgetfulness of ishavasi principle and upasate means the profitless pursuit or chase of sense gratification that is what means by the worship of avidya so that is the first point avidya mupasate this is the two concept and i just give you some examples to help you understand that fine and why purpose is profitless pursuit of sense gratification that's interesting maybe just briefly i'll touch upon it on uh, the subject of profitless pursuit profitless means you're not going to get anything after chasing after this sense gratification because lord shri krishna makes this point in fifth chapter of the 22nd verse of bhagavad gita ye hi samsparsh jab hoga dukha yoni evate adi antavant kante anate shurhamate madha so three characteristics are described in this uh, 22nd verse of fifth chapter first is futile insubstantial and temporary ye hi samsparsh jab hoga dukh yoni so as soon as as soon as our senses gets in contact with sense objects it gives birth to dukha dukh yoni yoni refers to a child womb uh, not a child dukh yoni eva certainly you know this word eva is very important wherever word eva is used which means it is emphasize that this is what it is there is no doubt about it and lord shri krishna is using it evate arjuna 110% it gonna give birth to misery why misery adi has a beginning antavanta has an end na teshu ramate mudaha 
therefore those are intelligent beings ramate budaha intelligent beings ramate not ramate they do not find happiness or they do not look for happiness uh, in temporary things so that's the reason both call calls it as uh, f- uh, the fruitless what was the statement the profitless sorry the profitless pursues so pursuit of sense gratification now a little bit i'm not going to too much details of it just for a second let's try to understand our nature of happiness in this world first as you said adi antavanta it has a beginning it has an end whatever you get when you don't have it you have a huge expectation about it and when you get it after a while you become bored with it yes or no we all have that experience maybe it's your new car maybe it's your house maybe it's your uh, the smartphone maybe it's your friend uh, it could happen with a spouse what not you know of course it's not in krishna conscious relationship but i'm just saying people who see as an object they all get bored with it that's the point here now what is the nature of happiness uh for example let's say to all of you all the all the participants here i offer you a 1 liter bottle bisleri bottle and i say please drink it now some of you may drink it all entirely some of you may take it half some of you may not touch it entirely the satisfaction that each one of you would get after drinking that water or probably not drinking that water depends on what any one of you have a clue about it it depends on what the satisfaction have you seen have you had that experience sometimes you say ha ah, man thanda ho gaya aaj you know when you drink a water you know sometimes this kind of an experience comes so i see a comment by mother taruni gopika she says thirst oh where is a comment other chat here yeah so okay a lot of people say hi naam prabhu and everyone says thirst 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 okay great a thirst is a state of happiness or is a state of misery is a misery is is an urge is a misery is a hankering which means the more you suffer i put it this way your happiness in the material world from the sense objects is directly proportional to your suffering is that making sense it's a mathematical equation to the degree one has undergone a suffering to that degree he would experience a joy of it and the irony is that joy is also short lived the moment you gulp a bottle of water you may feel a sense of relief imagine you have gone out for shopping in a hot sunny day of 48 degree celsius temperature and for 2 hours and you have not drank a drop of water you come back extremely thirsty you take a whole cold water gulp it down your throat and you feel extremely joyful about it but after 20 minutes the experience of joy goes away yes or no that is what it mean by uh, this uh, again i forgot the word purpose is the profitless pursuit of sense gratification is it making sense and you can apply this and see it in any and every context of the happiness that we get it therefore the first verse of each uh, nectar of instruction says vacho vegam manasa krodha vegam vegam are the urges which means the hankering we need to control this to the degree we have it in control therefore we have this culture of fasting why there is a culture of fasting janmashtami lord shri krishna loves that we fast not every day but on special occasions why because that gives us a strength to bear with our urges and to the degree we able to practice that to that degree we become disconnect you know from this whole idea that i need to necessarily fulfill my urges and then if we have a experience of spiritual joy that is the time person begins to understand that actually spiritual life has a meaning and that's the point about it that's the reason pope says profitless pursuit of uh, happiness uh, anything when you're looking in a metal contest cannot give us happiness for this reason now you say uh, i'll close with the last example imagine your mother has cooked your favorite dish for example aloo ka paratha or paneer paratha if you are from north india for south india let's say masala dosa okay whatever wherever you are from and for maharashtrian i don't know what they like they like everything maybe poha so imagine your mother have cooked the favorite dish of yours but but just you entered the house before that you had uh, two pizzas 
and you're full up to here. Can you really enjoy it? Although you, 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 you have that desire because you love alu, paratha, whatever, maybe you can take a bite or two. You cannot take more than that, isn't it? And the reason is because the urge, the suffering of hunger was not there. If the hunger was there, which is a suffering, you know, Hitopadesh uh, and other scriptures talk about it. These are the defects of the material body, lamentation, depression, etc. Hunger, these are said to be defects of the... If you had that, then you would have said, Mother, what a brilliant breakfast you have cooked. <laughs> okay, no. Now, because you're not hungry, you're not going to give that exclamation because that hunger is not there. That's the point and that's what Prabhupada is explaining here. All right. Uh, moving forward to the presentation again. Uh, a little quick now. Modless, uh, sorry, modern godless education is what Prabhupada explains in paragraph number four. So it is said to be in ignorance, Prabhupada says, to be in ignorance is bad, fine. To be in ignorance and to claim to be knowledge is worse. Example is non-theistic scientists, which refers to agnostics. Uh, you know, uh, they do not categorically deny the existence of God. Uh, you know, so that is what it refers to. You can call them as an innocent, uh, you know, those who do not know about the existence of God. So they're not rejecting it. They're called agnostics. They're a little doubtful. They're not sure about it. But the worst is to be in ignorance. Second, to claim that I know. And third, to condemn real knowledge as ignorance. What is that to condemn real knowledge? To call Vedic scriptures as mythology is the worst. And that is a point Prabhupada brings out uh, through this discussion uh, on this, the fourth paragraph here, uh, like this. With this, Mukund Prabhu will finish off the remaining purport, uh, sorry, the remaining paragraph that we are reading, and then we'll a little bit elaborate more on this point of modern uh, godless education. Please go ahead. Wherever you had left. Please unmute. Yeah. Ah, yes, Prabhu. In the Haripati Sudodaya 3.11.12, the advancement of education by a godless people is compared to decorations on a dead body. In India, as in many other countries, some people follow the custom of leading a procession with a decorated dead body for the pleasure of the lamenting relatives. In the same way, modern civilization is a patchwork of activities meant to cover the perpetual miseries of material existence. All such activities are aimed towards sense gratification. But above the senses is the mind, and above the mind is the intelligence, and above the intelligence is the soul. Thus, the aim of real education should be self-realization, the realization of the spiritual values of the soul. Any education which does not lead to such realization must be considered a vidya or a science. And to such and to and to culture such science means to go down to the darkest region of ignorance. Hare Krishna. So modern godless education. Prabhupada will call it as slaughterhouses. Actually, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saswati Thakur used to call it. Um, uh, he had written this uh, whole commentary on the demons where he called Putana as the modern teacher. <laughs> uh, just like Kamsa had said, sent, uh, uh, you know, Putana uh, to kill Krishna. Similarly, uh, in the modern world, uh, you know, we bring these modern educators and teachers to destroy the spiritual life of uh, our child. <laughs> so it was an interesting analogy. <laughs> of course, don't share it in a public program. This is a private forum, so I'm saying the modern teachers are like Putna. <laughs> you might offend somebody out there. And in case if you are a teacher, don't worry. Huh? It was not a personal comment. <laughs> Anyways, coming back to the subject here. So what's, what's the trouble? What's the problem? Why Prabhupada will call it as a slaughterhouses? This is something we need to think about a little bit. So the reason is our subtle body has a mind and intelligence. And the subtle body creates two obstacles. Mind creates desires and intelligence creates doubts. 
mind creates desires and intelligence creates doubt. Now look at the education that we go through or that we have in our school from the kindergarten days up to the 12th standard and maybe beyond that, there's not even a single reference of God, you know. Uh, at least up to my age, there was at least some reference of Ramayana and Mahabharata in today's generation, it's not allowed on the name of secularism, at least in India. And then we are taught theories like uh, Darwin's theory, Big Bang theory and whatnot that make persons entirely, uh, you know, uh, the function of intelligence is to doubt it makes a person totally doubtful about the existence of God. And that's how this is called as intellectual animalism. I'll speak about it in a short while, where they kind of destroy his individual's any ability or potential to even hear the subject matter of God consciousness. Because all his life he has been fed with so much doubt on the subject matter of God consciousness that he just doesn't want to listen to. And that's what happens with the most of the modern generation. And not only that, even it happens unfortunately with the devotee kids. Not that every devotee kid go on, goes on to become a devotee, not all the time. It's very difficult to raise a child in the modern society. Now, mind creates desires. Now you look at the education and the social structure that we have in our schools where the boys and girls sit together, their dress code and everything, uh, the kind of education is given. Probably all of you and the parents who have teenage kids will know, you'll experience, the modern education creates more and more lust in the minds of the uh, young kids, yes or no? And that is where it's directed to. And that's the reason Popa will call the modern education, the school as a slaughterhouses. It fills the mind with lust. It fills the intelligence with doubt. Where is the scope of Krishna consciousness? It is just not possible. That's the point here. However, back in India, still there is some scope and that's the reason ISKCON is progressing in, this, uh, in India uh, so far uh, because it's a land of piety. So Indians by default have this ingrained in their genes that they would not pay much attention to science unless it brings them direct sense gratification. So they may hear about Darwin's theory, Big Bang theory and what not, but before the exam they'll go to Ganeshji temple and still pray, Ganeshji pass kara <laughs> Know? And then they'll go to the exam hall and they'll write, oh, Darwin's theory, you know, our ancestors were apes, Big Bang theory, there was no God, there was an explosion. So that is that is just a side effect of piety that they've carried from their previous life. So still there is some hope and potential in India, otherwise everywhere else is really, really very dangerous. Now, another point about this intellectual analysis, uh, animalism, um, I'll just make one short point on this that how this whole scientific advancement uh, and the modern education because the character has not been emphasized uh, you know a largely an attention has been given to competency right which means skills but not on character uh, what had led to that had led to what they call there's a terminology in spiritual forums which call as intellectual animalism which means that the person has become so hard-hearted so self-centered and so selfish that the person is willing to go to any extent for fulfilling one sense gratification. To give you an example of animal husbandry and animal farming in America and the European countries, how they treat animals. I have some one or two points mentioned here, I'll just read out. It is said, the hens are given some chemicals so that they can keep giving eggs, which drains the calcium of the body because the calcium goes away, it drains the body of the calcium, the hands cannot even stand on their legs because the legs cannot sustain the weight. The, 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 the caretakers there, they further give them chemicals that makes the hand feel cold so that they can lay more eggs, there is something like that. And like this, they cause torture. It is also mentioned about this intellectual animalism. Then in cow slaughterhouses, they give electric shocks to the cows and they also make them anemic so that the cow's flesh turns pale instead of red which is being preferred by customers and there are many many kind of violent crimes are being done on animals i'm just reading about two things now this is called as intellectual animalism which means they're using the god-given intelligence rather than understanding why do i suffer what's the purpose of life and to understand god 
They're using the God-given intelligence to exploit innocent animals. And that's the reason in spiritual forum, this is called as intellectual animalism. And this is the gift of modern education system. And what is their destination? As the verse says, Andham Tama Pravishanti. Therefore, this verse says, for such ignorant fools, they end up going to uh, a, a hellish situation, a hellish life. They live a hellish life and they end up into a hellish life. All right, let's go to the, this was so far about avidya. Let's quickly touch about vidyayam rataha. The rest of the purpose to speak about vidyayam rataha. So let's start reading it para by para. Different, different devotees can go ahead. Uh, please read. Some mistaken educators. Yes, Mother Reshma. According to the Bhagavad Gita 2.42, 7.15, mistaken mundane educators are known as Veda Varada Ratha and Maya Mayaya Bharata Nana Jnana. They may also be atheistic demons, the lowest of men. Those who are Veda Varada Ratha pose themselves as very learned in the Vedic literature. But unfortunately, they are completely diverted from the purpose of the Vedas. In the Bhagavad Gita 15.15, it is said that the purpose of the Vedas is to know the personality of Godhead. But these Veda Vada Ratha men are not at all interested in the personality of Godhead. On the contrary, they are fascinated by such fruitive results as the attainment of heaven. Hare Krishna. All right. So let's somebody else read out. We'll read the whole thing, then I'll give you a summary. So here, first paragraph talks about Vedavatra. I mean, I mean to the paragraph that was just read. Vedavatra was discussed. We'll elaborate it in a short while. Please read another devotee. Yes, another. Sir. yes please. Uh, as stated in Mantra 1, one should know that the personality of Godhead is the proprietor of everything and that we must be satisfied with our allotted portion of the necessities of life. The purpose of all the Vedic literature is to awaken this God consciousness in the forgetful living beings. And this same purpose is presented in the various ways in the different scriptures of the world for the understanding of a foolish mankind. Thus, the ultimate purpose of all religion is to bring one back to Godhead. So Prabhupada here clarifies what is the purpose of uh, religion, uh, you know, is to bring one back to Godhead. But Prabhupada continues, the Vedvadratha people, Vedvadratha people are like Karmakandis, those who use religion for the purpose of sense gratification. That's what Vedvadratha here. Uh, please read next paragraph. Somebody else. The Vedvata Ved Ratha people, instead of realizing that the purpose of the Vedas is to revive the forgetful soul's lost relationship with the personality of Godhead, take it for granted that such side issues as the attainment of heavenly pleasure or sense gratification, the lust for which causes their material bondage in the first place, are the ultimate end of the Vedas. Such people misguide others by misinterpreting the Vedic literature. Sometimes they even condemn the Pranas, which are authentic Vedic explanation for laymen. The Vedavata Ratas give their own explanation of the Vedas, neglecting the authorities of great teachers, Acharyas. They also tend to raise some unscrupulous persons from among themselves and present him as the leading exponent of Vedic knowledge. Such Vedvata Ratas Oh, it continues? Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Such Vedvata Ratas are especially condemned in this mantra by the very appropriate Sanskrit word Vidyayam Rataha. Vidyayam refers to the studies of Vedas because the Vedas are the origin of all knowledge, Vidya. And the Ratha means those engaged. Vidyayam Ratha Thus means those engaged in the studies of the Vedas. The so-called students of the Vedas are condemned herein because they are ignorant of the actual purpose of the Vedas on account of their dis disobeying the Acharyas. Such Vedvata Ratas search out meaning in every word of the Vedas to suit their own purposes. They do not know the Vedic literature is a collection of extraordinary book, books 
that can be understood only through the chain of disciplic succession yes next so so far vedvat tatha has been discussed we'll we'll definitely talk about it in short while uh, but however you can mark it as a homework for yourself uh, read this paragraphs that we have just read after the four categories were given and they are almost i have marked in my book uh, so just for you to you know do a little exercise there are almost 8 to 10 characteristics of vedvat ratha shila prabhupad highlights uh will not have a time to look into each of it and, and discuss it but we'll give a brief of it but at least you read it a post session and then mark all those you know headings or uh, other characteristics uh that's just very important to understand you know each one of it at least you should know what it is go ahead the next devotee the last two paragraphs okay uh one must approach a bona fide spiritual master in order to understand the transcendental message of the vedas that is the direction of the mukund upanishad 1.2.12 these vedvad ratha people however have their own acharyas who are not in the chain of transcendental transcendental succession thus they progress into the darkest region of ignorance by misinterpreting the vedic literature they fall even further into ignorance than those who have no knowledge of the vedas at all thank you next devotee narayan prabhu your hand is up please go ahead the last paragraph so so far vedvat ratha has continued <coughs> and if you can just uh, you know note down all those different different points popad mentions popad have literally kind of open the can which shows you you know different different spiritual organization that they are they nothing but vedvat ratha on the name of you know bona fide gurus they're just cheating people actually and the last paragraph is about maya ahaparat gyana class of men please go ahead read it and you have to un- 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 unmute yourself so there seems to be some issue nila mata ji can The Maya or Aparhartha Jnana class of men are self-made gods. Such men think that they are themselves god, and there is no necessity of worshiping any other god. They will agree to worship an ordinary man if he happens to be rich, but they will never worship the actual personality of God. Such foolish men cannot recognize their own foolishness regarding the question of how God can ever have been entrapped by illusion. If God ever If God were ever entrapped by illusion, then illusion would be more powerful than God. But they also say that God is all powerful. So if God is all powerful, then how can He be overpowered by illusion? The self-made gods cannot answer all these questions very clearly, but they are satisfied that they have become God themselves. <laughs> I kind of remember a, a, a little funny story here. so i mean at least let me give you a little gist of it what we just read so maya aprat gyana refers to an ordinary fellow who considers some man as to be a god so there was two brothers and a sister from south india uh, who declared themselves as brahma vishnu mahesh and they fooled people for a good amount of time and then there was a complaint filed against them so they ran away from there and then shifted to odisha and there they became jagannath baldev subhadra <laughs> and they continue to pull people out there so this is what it means by maya ahaprat gyana you know those intelligence has been stolen they consider any any tom dick and harry and who says i am god somebody can produce some kind of an ashes and what not a famous uh, guru from south was no more anymore papa would chastise him also for that you know would produce some ash and they would say this is god and all that that is maya ahaprat gyana like that So let's come back to Vedavadatta for the time that we have available with us. Let's go back to a slide deck, and let's see what we have there. Okay. Hmm. Before, uh, just a comment that I uh, wanted to mention, which was mentioned here in my book. Uh, I forgot to. Uh, just before we go to Vedavadatta, one more thing on modern godless education. Uh, Prabhupada spoke about this education, right? Modern uh, godless education. but we need to also look at this modern entertainment which has become very very famous isn't it so we understand the modern education is uh, like a slaughterhouse but what about modern entertainment 
One devotee made a very beautiful comment about it. He said, modern entertainment is like a painkiller. What is a painkiller? Uh, it, it makes your body numb, which means you don't experience a pain. It's an illusion. You don't forget your, you don't become freed from your misery. Misery is still there, but you don't have an experience of a misery. But if you continue taking a painkiller, a pain uh, the same painkiller, then after a while, uh, that effect also dies away. And you end up with a misery. Therefore, those who take shelter of this whole modern entertainment, social media, and they try to look for happiness there, for a time being when they have, you know, youthful life and funful, you know, when they don't have much responsibility, you know, those teenage years to the college life and whatnot, they feel like they're having a great life. But that doesn't last for long. And when that whole balloon of hallucination is uh, busted with the time, then they have to face a very stark reality and the reality is they're still lonely, they're still miserable, they're still suffering and that is why there is an exponential increase in suicide cases among the teenagers in the present day than ever before in the history. Because people have got so glued to this modern entertainment which gives them an experience of a joy but it's like a painkiller. That was the one point here. Let's move forward to Vedavadarata quickly. So Vedavadarata, uh, there are a lot of points have been mentioned here. I'll go one by one uh, quickly through the book uh, that we have. Very first point Prabhupada says, uh, they pose themselves as very learned in the Vedic literature, but unfortunately they are completely diverted from the purpose of the Vedas. One very senior devotee was sharing one interesting point and he said he had gone to South India and uh, there he saw some brahmanas worshipping some Lord Vishnu temple, a very ancient temple, and they were having a tea, chai, you know, and tea is considered intoxication within his khan. Papa said not to have tea. So this devotee was also from that particular spiritual organization or, or the forum. There was Shri Vaishnavas actually. So he was earlier also Shri Vaishnava before coming to his khan. So he began to argue with those brahmanas. So he said, why are you drinking tea? Tea should not be drank and all that. He said, no, 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 tea is all right. You should also take tea. And there was a discussion going on. So this devotee from Iskand said, okay, if you're so bent on taking a tea, then offer to Krishna. He said, oh no, how can we offer to Krishna? We cannot offer tea to Krishna. Then he said, how can you take tea when you cannot offer? So they were conditioned so badly by or habituated to this. Although they claimed that they know everything, yet they could not practice. Just like during book distribution last year, not the last year, previous year to that, I remember meeting one, uh, one man, he was standing on a bike and he was smoking. So I took a copy of Bhagavad Gita, I thought he desperately needs it. You know, he, he, God knows when his lungs will explode, I should go first to him. <laughs> so I went up to him, I said, sir, you look like an educated man and I have got a special gift on the occasion of upcoming Gita Jayanti, he's a Bhagavad Gita. You know what he did? Uh, at least people have some respect here. So he took out his smoke, threw it on the ground, crushed it with his feet, and suddenly he began to open his t shirt. So I was like, Why is he getting undressed? I didn't say, I have a copy of Bhagavad Gita. Why is he getting undressed? And suddenly he opened his t shirt a little bit and put his hand inside and then took out a thread. Swamiji, I'm already a Brahmana. I know everything. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, if you are a Brahmana, why are you smoking? He didn't have any answer for that. But this whole idea that I know everything uh, actually uh, causes that, you know, roadblock where he could not understood. So that's the point here. Uh, the very first thing. Second thing Prabhupada mentions in the third paragraph from there, that discussion. Prabhupada says, rather than recognizing or realizing the purpose of the Vedas, they take it granted the side issues such as the attainment of heavenly pleasure for sense gratification and whatnot. Okay, I don't think so this presentation is needed right now. I'll show that later on. I'll go through the book first. So, so these Vedvadratas, they utilize scriptures for the purpose of Karmakanda or the purpose of uh, heavenly pleasures. So, South Indians, they just love to go to America. I know, if particularly from Tamil Nadu. Uh, I also went to America just because I studied in Vellore University, which happens to be in Tamil Nadu. And all my gang, means friends from Hyderabad and Chennai, they were going to America and they took me along also. That's how I ended to America. Otherwise, there was never ever I was, I was de destined to go to America. So when you have such a huge amount of people going to America, of course the visa would have an issue. So there is a very special temple in Chennai, which is called as Visa Ganesh Temple. Mukundan Prabhu. Uh, he, he is like a very pro prolific, knows about 
every ancient temple. Are you aware of this Visa Ganesh temple in Chennai? <laughs> yes? See, that's an evidence that exists. I had only heard of a story. Hey, I missed it, huh? You should have taken me when I came last time there. So when I visit you next time, please take me to the Visa Ganesh temple. <laughs> I want to see. <laughs> so, so, so before, uh, before anyone goes to embassy for filing the application, it is must ritual. They should get blessing of a Visa Ganesh temple. Why they name Ganeshji Visa Ganesh? It's just because Ganeshji is very kind there. And if you go and pray to him, he'll award you visa. So they named Ganeshji Visa Ganesh. <laughs> and I believe there is some Brahmana Pandit sitting. He's giving you extra blessing like that. So that's, that's an example of it. Other, uh, this was a little on the funny side. Other on the other, other side of it is Jihad. As you see in other religion. Where they say on the name of God, you kill yourself, you kill others, and there are 71 virgins or whatnot. They talk about it, waiting in the heaven. So again, they are misusing the religion for the purpose of sense pleasure. That is a point which is being mentioned in the third paragraph here. Uh, another thing which is mentioned purpose is such kind of Vedavadaratas, they misguide people by yeah, misquoting or misrepresenting. I'm not going to uh, quote the name because this is recorded. So there's a very famous corporate spiritual guru uh, in India. Uh, he's been hired by many, many top MNCs. He's written many books, uh, you know, about Lord, Mother Sita, Lord Ram, etc., etc. And this rascal doesn't know even a single word of Sanskrit. So he's a fanboy or uh, the most cherished boy of the secular liberals and whatnot. And uh, he's brought in any and every forum, wherever there is a discussion on about Vedic studies and so forth. And people, uh, or you know, the secular lobby uh, portrays him as to be the genuine Vedic scholar. And uh, his, his, all his versions are entire speculations. Uh, because he's not, first of all, have studied Sanskrit, doesn't know Sanskrit, is all misinterpretation. And then he has written so many books. And that's the point. They misguide others by misinterpreting Vedic literature and has a huge following, uh, you know, uh, among the corporate world like that. Sometimes they condemn Puran as an interesting thing is the books that he has written, he writes that it is based on mythology, Ramayana, mythology, Mahabharata. You know, TTD, uh, Tirumala, you know, so one of the times when I went, I generally have a nature to pick up books. So I went there and I purchased some books just to know, you know, get to know about that place more in depth. So while I was coming back in a train, I had taken a yatra. When I was coming back, I was reading it. The very first, first page, the introduction when I read, my blood boiled. The author was a very senior member of the TTD forum. And I thought he would be a Vaishnava. And he writes, this is all based on a mythological story that Shivalaji existed here. So the very first page, he writes that Balaji is mythology. The whole, this whole thing is mythology. What do you read about it? And such kind of people are the one who actually runs this TTD and whatnot. So they misguide. They condemn Puranas or authentic Vedic explanation. Prabhupada writes there. They neglect the authority of the great teachers. They have their own explanation. There is a very famous guru in India today uh, who said to be, a, I don't want to again name it, uh, uh, you know. Uh, of course, he is doing some good constructive work also, but again, it's on the side of humanitarian, bodily consciousness, nothing on the spiritual side. But he's misguiding people on the spiritual forum by saying that, that he is a spiritual teacher. Somebody asked him, what is the source of your knowledge? Have you studied Vedic scriptures? He said, no, I have never studied and I would tell everyone never ever study. So the person asked, why? Because if you study Mahabharata, Bhagavad Gita, Ramayana, then you create a certain perception of the world, of the reality. Therefore, we should be a free thinker. Our knowledge should not be based on anything. So question arises from where does he get his knowledge? Knowledge has to have a source. Nobody is born with the knowledge. And he has every single comment, every comment on every issue to pass on. So there was a conference going on in America in Chicago. One of our devotee, a very big businessman from Bombay, he was also part of that. It was a corporate conference. And there was a panel where this corporate was sitting and this... Uh, Guru was sitting on the side with a discussion going on in spiritual harmony in business enterprise. And a discussion came upon Ayodhya. This was a few years before. And up in the forum, he said, Lord Ram never existed. This is a mythological story. So the devotee who was personally present, he got so angry at him that he kind of, you know, s said it publicly and he walked away. Okay, that reminds me, I would not have time to talk about the subject matter, which is 
So I'll do one thing. I'll just speak on what Prabhupada writes here. But there is something very interesting that Madhvacharya have written about this purport, about this verse. Because I just realized our time has run out. Next week when we meet, we'll talk about Madhvacharya's commentary to this verse. Please remind me if in case I forget. He speaks something about call as uh, the sin of omission and sin of commission. It's a very interesting concept and it's very important for all of us to understand it as a practicing sadhakas. Coming back to the story of, you know, this guru. Uh, so, so once oh, once he was, another one, last example on this, another public forum, he was there and a question was asked to him about Ayodhya. He said, well, you say Lord Ram never existed, but why you want? No, well, he didn't. He never said Lord Ram never existed. Sorry, I take my words back. He never said Lord Ram never existed. He said Lord Ram existed, but he's not Lord. You know, human being can never be a Lord. That was a point he made. So another forum asked question was asked, you said Ram is not Lord. Then why Hindus are so bent on building a temple in Ayodhya? So his answer was, well, yes, Ram is not a Lord because human being cannot be Lord. We all are the eternal energy, you know, we are the Brahman. Like that's something he gave a big answer. He said, why we want temple in Ayodhya? Why we are determined for it? Because Ram has lived a very ideal life. He was an ideal king. As an Indians, we take him as a role model. So he's sitting as a, and he has a spiritual organization. His name also has a spiritual identity connected to it. And then he comes in a public forum and say, Lord never exists. There is no God. God, you know, you know, we are what we are and so forth. That's what Prabhupada is saying here. This kind of Vedvadatas, they neglect the authorities of great teachers. They do not know the purpose of Vedas and they con uh, you know, they concoct their own meanings. Like that, some of the characteristics of Vedvadatas are being explained. Just let me quickly bring you on the presentation. Some few points from Bhagavad Gita here. Um, let's take a look at quickly here. Misguide people, misinterpret tato bhaiya evate tamo. Like. So this is a verse from Bhagavad Gita. Somebody can read out. This is second chapter, verse number 42-43, where Ved Vat Ratha, word comes. Uh, you know, you see the third line, Ved Vat Rataha. So this is a translation of that. Somebody read out, please. Men of small knowledge are very much attached to the flowery words of the Vedas, which recommend various fruitive activities for elevation to heavenly planets, resultant good work, power, and so forth. Being desirous of sense gratification and opulent life, they say that there is nothing more than this. So, what they want, they are men of small knowledge. So in your preaching, also, you'll come across a lot of people who only come to get some temporary relief from their suffering. And when their things become okay, then they walk away. Have you come across people like this? In my corporate outreach, often I come across. You know, for them, the practice of spirituality, the chanting of holy names of the Lord is only just to give them some relief and they walk away. And that's what this Vedvatata. Next, uh, this is ninth chapter, verse number 20 and 21 again talks about this Vedvatata. Please read out. When, when they have thus enjoyed vast heavenly sense pleasure. Those who study the Vedas, uh, that's a 20th translation and 21st cent. Those who study the Vedas. Those who study the Vedas and drink the Soma juice, seeking the heavenly planets, worship me indirectly, purified of sinful reactions, they take birth on the pious heavenly planet of Indra, where they enjoy godly delights. Go ahead. When they have thus enjoyed vast heavenly sense pleasure and the results of the pious activity are exhausted, they return to that mortal planet again. Thus, those who seek sense enjoyment by adhering to the principles of the three Vedas achieve only repeated birth and death. Interestingly, if I have been asked a question from Bhagavad Gita the most, that is from this verse which is in the orange box. And particularly one, one particular line, that is a Soma juice. Some people have a lot of attraction for this Soma juice. And this Soma juice refers to alcohol. So many times people ask the question, Oh, you say no intoxication. Bhagavad Gita Krishna says Soma juice. What is this Soma juice? So, so far I don't know. I have never tasted. If anyone of you know what about Soma juice and answer, you can please personally ping me. At least where I am, my area of outreach, the corporates. This is their favorite verse. They, they justify and certify their intoxication by quoting this verse of Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> you know, Krishna says about Soma juice in Bhagavad Gita. Uh, that was it on Vedavad. Maya Pratgyanas refers to Brahmavadis and Mayavadis. 
uh, we'll take that next time because it takes few minutes so that discussion will take it next time when we meet uh, just a few points about this brahmavadis and who are mayavadis like that we'll we'll conclude next week with that so hare krishna because time is up is 2:40 now we haven't taken any questions also so in essence text number 9 as we saw vidyam uh, uh, avidya and vidya avidya refers to uh, ignorant pursuit of sense gratification and vidya here refers to uh, the kind of knowledge uh, which denies the existence of the lord you know which takes us away from spiritual goal is what has been described here as uh, vidya yam rataha and propat cause am vedvat rataha and maya apratyana these are the two kind of categories of people discussed in that so vedvat rataha and maya apratyana are more dangerous than those who are ignorantly pursuing after sense gratification because they claim that they know they claim they know bhagavad gita they claim to be a spiritualist but their goal is entirely sense gratification and nothing else with that we pause here for today on text number 9 to next time when we meet uh, we'll li- briefly discuss about the last point maya pratyana and something very interesting from uh, madhvacharya's commentary where he raises a question if you look at the madhva sampradha the most of the writings are focused on defeating mayavad majority the majority of attention had been on defeating mayavad and and uh, madhvacharya personally did that so in their lineage you know generation after generation so many books are written so one of the acharya from madhva sampradaya will write a book debunking the shankaracharya's philosophy if you know of udupi is a you know the hub of uh madhu sampradaya and just right next to it was also hub of shankaracharya they're just 20 25 kilometers away from each other and then from shankaracharya much somebody would write debunking what the you know somebody in the descendant of madhu acharya wrote then the another generation of madhu acharya would write a debunk it so that goes back and forth between them like that so he in uh, madhu acharya and this was talks about why we uh, uh speak strongly against mayavad yeah shingeri thank you thank you for reminding me odupian shingeri uh, madhacharya writes why we speak so strongly against mayavad and i feel that's very very important for us to know because shila prabhupada was also heavy at times about mayavad that discussion will take in next time with that i'll pause here for today thank you so much for your kind attention uh, if in case anyone has any comments or any quick questions we can take that yes uh, one hand is up madhu satya please go ahead ಪ್ರಭುಜಿಲ್ at the end of it you again have to die you again have to take a birth and you continue in the cycle that is what means profitless rather regardless of that if you aim for a uh, spiritual joy that's a real profit neha vikrama nashasti pratyavayo na vidyate swalpamasya dharmasya trayate mahato bhyat because any bhakti done or any progress or any service done in a spiritual life krishna says swalpam you know very even for me good time that can save you from the greatest danger so any material endeavor para bhavastavat abodh jato yavan na jigyasat atma tatvam fifth canto fifth chapter fifth verse please read the translation and purport of it papa talks about rishi they speaks this to his sons hundred sons you know it's all futile if a person who has taken a birth in a human life he does not make an inquiry atma tatvam does not make an inquiry who am i what is my relationship with the absolute truth then everything is futile is of no use why because person continues to make endeavor to engage in fruitive activities because of which his mind becomes more and more lusty filled with more and more desires more and more condition as a result of it has to take birth again when you take a birth again do you carry anything from your previous life except for karmic baggage you don't carry anything 
and there is only suffering that goes on. That is why it is Prabhupada said, profitless pursuit of sense gratification. Okay, at least at least in this life it makes gives me joy. That doesn't happen also. Adi Antavanta Kanteya. TK Prabhupada, I would not get anything in my next life. At least for this lifetime I get a joy out of it. But that is also not there, na? Adi Antavanta Kanteya. It has a beginning, it has an end. And we keep on demanding more and more. That's the reason people are saying this is a profitless of your time. All right? Thank you, Sadhguru. Hare Krishna. So, thank you all. Looks like no further questions or clarification. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Varsha Mantra Ji wanted to. Oh, there is something. Yes, go ahead. Um, thank you very much for the class. I uh, just wanted to ask, uh, you know, you touched upon that um, godless uh, education and how uh, kids of devotee can turn into non-devotees because of the association and all. So what is the solution, Prabhu? Because I agree with each and every point you've mentioned. So what can we do? I would say that's the biggest challenge right now which our community faces actually everywhere. And that's not uh, only with the you know devotees who are living abroad. That is very much in India also. Even with the co congregation and the kids living in a community, because the kind of an exposure that the young generation is getting today, you know, is very very difficult. Uh, you, uh, I mean, it's very difficult for us to keep them restricted only to a devotee community, only to a devotional content. It's just not possible. Exactly. So, for that reason, um, you know, at your level, you should be as good as a role model, as loving, as caring, uh, to a degree where they don't try to fulfill that emptiness which everyone has somewhere else. The greatest challenge the kids today face probably, which we didn't have it at that point of time, where parents are willing to give them the comfort, uh, the objects, but not the time. At least while we were growing up, we had all the time with our parents, yes or no? Today, parents are having less and less time with the kids. Uh, but that is what does not, that is, uh, that does not comfort them. You know, you get them an iPhone, you get them a new car, that really doesn't help them. We just discussed about the profitless pursuit of sense gratification. But what can really, really help them if uh, parents spend a time, but how does parents spend a time? Because most of the time, both the parents are working. Where is the time? So if you ask for yourself, if that's the situation, we can't even blame the kids. Because actual community and that we had before, if you look at the Vedic culture, the child was not a responsibility of a parent, the child was a responsibility of a community. Uh, Viduji says in Mahabharata, it takes a community to raise a child. You know, earlier there was a joint family structure. I mean, why to go back in those? I mean, if I look back at my own upbringing, we lived in a community. Of course, community was a whole bungalows. We had it. And everyone knew everyone. We can at any point of time hop in anyone's house, anyone's, any auntie house and all that. They will embrace us with open arm. If it's the time for lunch, they'll say, okay, come and have lunch. Everyone treated like a like, like you know everyone treated us an individual like a son or a daughter if it was a female there was no you know there was never like oh who is this is a neighbor's son or daughter get lost from here everyone cared and if if in case anything happened to us then there was you know rest of the society was there to, to take care of us people will come they cared for us so when you already had the loving relationship and love and care that brings in shelter that actually gives hope to a child. Otherwise, uh, a vacuum is created in the heart where the person feels shelterless, not being cared, which results into fear, fear of loneliness. And that is what drives them to take Hare Krishna. Can we just mute? Yeah. And that is what drives them more to take shelter of this kind of a sense objects. So, I don't know how much is possible. If it's possible, ideally, the mother should be a homemaker. I'm using the word ideally. All right? Uh, ideal is a big word. Ideally, mother should be a homemaker. Uh, I'll conclude with this point. Uh, Bhava Tarani Mataji, recently we were doing Prabhupada Katha, so we are sharing that point there. Bhava Tarani Mataji, right? She had two kids. 
and what she would do she would leave her kids under the care of other devotees because that time devotee community lived close by right so she will leave the uh, leave her kids young kids in the care of other devotees and she'll go into deity worship and she had written a letter uh, a kind of a report about her services and saying that you know uh, that i'm doing deity worship so she thought popa will be very happy because she's engaging in deity worship and not giving much attention to her own kids and popa's response was incredible uh, to her shock actually popa said uh, you're not actually doing deity worship you're doing an offense because your deities are your kids your responsibility is to take care of your kids deities can be taken care by somebody else because your deities are your kids is what you should be taking care of you know i have that uh, if you want you can ping me i can share that i don't have the book right now with me here other than right now read out the exact thing that popa wrote that should be in another room popa said your deities are your kids that they needs a first attention then if time permits you can go into deity service so what to do times and situations are difficult uh, I, i'm just sharing a principle as i said ideal situation is a mother is a homemaker but i understand there are a lot of financial constraints and a lot of other issues but that goes back to you individually to see how to function it but please understand the child psychology uh, the kids need love and affection and love and affection for them means time the more time you spend to them is what translates into love and affection for them and the lesser time you spend with them to that degree they'll become you know averse to you detached from you and they have to find a shelter for love and care somewhere else and but naturally as they're going through anamoy pranamoy manamoy kosh as their age is progressing you know the consciousness is also getting evolved so finding the shelter within their brothers and sister now they'll find shelter with the outside friends and the crisis begins so it's very difficult <laughs> that's what i can say <laughs> because you kind of asked the question i gave you the details of it so i could only say all the best we sincerely pray Thank that you. Uh, you get some strength and courage to deal with this uh, challenge of the 21st century Thank you very much Hare Krishna Shila Prabhupada ki Jai